Daily news and analysis. We keep you informed and inspired. This is World Today. Hello and welcome to World Today. I'm Zhao Ying. Coming up, China proposes actions plans to jointly advance modernization with Africa. How can these plans be effectively implemented? A South China Morning Post article suggests that while the U.S. doubles down on its hard power, China is making its mark with soft power. We delve deeper into the implications of China's growing soft power on the global stage. Chinese President Xi Jinping says China-Africa relations are at their best in history. He made the remarks at the opening ceremony of the 2024 summit of the Forum on China-Africa Cooperation in Beijing. President Xi proposed elevating China's ties with all African countries that have diplomatic relations to the level of strategic relations. He also proposed that the overall positioning of China-Africa relations be elevated to an all-weather China-Africa community with a shared future in the new era. The Chinese president said China and Africa have always understood and supported each other, setting an example for a new type of international relations. Sun Ziyuan has more. More than 3,000 leaders, officials, and business representatives from China and Africa gather at the Great Hall of the People on Thursday morning for the opening ceremony of the 2024 summit on Fukuoka. Chinese President Xi Jinping said, after nearly 70 years of hard work, China-Africa relations are at their best in history. Thanks to nearly 70 years of tireless efforts from both sides, the China-Africa relationship is now at its best in history. With its future growth in mind, I propose that bilateral relations between China and all African countries having diplomatic ties with China be elevated. To the level of strategic relations, and that the overall characterization of China-Africa relations be elevated to an all-weather China-Africa community with a shared future for the new era. China has been Africa's largest trading partner for 15 consecutive years, and Africa is also China's second-largest overseas contracting projects market. President Xi said the trust and friendship will be sustained with more cooperation. China and Africa account for one third of the world population. Without our modernization, there will be no global modernization. In the next three years, China will work with Africa to take the following ten partnership actions for modernization to deepen China-Africa cooperation and spearhead the global South modernization. First, the partnership action for mutual learning among civilizations. Second, the partnership action for trade prosperity. Third, the partnership action for industrial chain cooperation. Fourth, the partnership action for connectivity. Fifth, the partnership action for development cooperation. Sixth, the partnership action for health. Seventh, the partnership action for agriculture and livelihoods. Eighth, the partnership action for people-to-people -people exchanges. Ninth, the partnership action for green development. Tenth, the partnership action for common security. President Xi said, "The dream of modernization pursued by China and Africa will surely set off a wave of modernization in the global South." That is Chen Ziyuan reporting. And for more, we are joined on the line by Dr. He Wenping, Africa expert and senior research fellow at Chinese Academy of Social Sciences, and Zun Ahmed Khan, research fellow at the Center for China and Globalization. So, thank you both for joining us. And uh, uh, Professor He, let me start with you. President Xi proposed elevating the overall characterization of China-Africa relations to an all-weather China-Africa community with a shared future in the new era. Can you explain what that exactly means, and what significance does it, this elevation hold? Well, uh, okay, thank you for having me. I think uh, this uh, new definition uh, for China-Africa uh, this relationship, you know, highlights uh, one is uh, all weather, 
Another is uh, in the new year, uh, because before we have been uh, talking about China-African community with shared future uh, a long time already. So now upgraded to this, uh, uh, you know, the keywords all weather, I think means, uh, you know, the China-African relation will be, you know, uh, always uh, good, no matter it's a, a cold uh, time or the warm time or the wind or the rain. So you see now we have been gone through a lot of international changes up and down. So a lot of like uh, uh, even uh, diplomatically security, uh, some regional war has been happening and Africa also suffering from those challenges, even public health challenge uh, like this COVID-19. So no matter what kind of challenge now show up, and then China, Africa will be always, uh, you know, hand in hand, uh, you know, uh, always uh, joined hand together. So I think this is what it means, all weather. And then in the new, new year, uh, which means now we are joined hands to uh, in our journey to modernization. Uh, in China, since the 20th Parties Congress, yeah, we, we are seeing now we are doing our Chinese style modernization. Now this summit, talk about China, Africa, join the hands uh, to go to the modernization together. So it's not just China now doing Chinese style modernization. Now we team up with Africa together. Uh, Africa also needs uh, to realize their modernization. So this modernization way totally different uh, with the Western countries they used to do uh, like uh, uh, realize their colon uh, modernization through, uh, you know, colonialism. Uh, that is like President Xi said today in his opening address. He said that the Western country, they realize their modernization, but it's, uh, you know, from the pain they imposed on all those developing countries. So now our developing country, we realize our modernization cannot uh, repeat that kind of way. So this is the new year, uh, what I understood. Okay, so uh, Zun, the President Xi also proposed elevating China's ties with all African countries that have developed, uh, I mean, diplomatic relations to the level of strategic relations. So what does mm. that indicate about China-Africa ties, um, especially if you consider China's role on the continent? Mm. Thank you, firstly, Zhaoying, for having me. And I'll, I'll resonate uh, uh, to almost a great extent, you know, with what Professor Ho said, that uh, really this is a relationship, you know, between China and the African continent that has uh, now for obviously 70 years, but particularly since the founding of FOCAC, there is a, there is a sense of all-weather partnership, all-weather trust, which means that on a strategic level, and I think I'll take that all-weather and strategic, I think the, the two definitions can also connect because strategic means that, you know, whether it comes to domestic development goals, whether it comes to, you know, if you talk about the SDGs and global governance, whether we talk about industrialization, poverty alleviation, or even, you know, broader ideas, interests on what the world must look like, better representation, less marginalization, better say in global matters, uh, better representation in terms of, you know, various, um, uh, uh, you know, uh, facets of the international organizations. On all of those levels, I think what strategic really emphasizes, just as uh, does the, the idea of all weather emphasize, that our vision, our realities, our way forward, what we desire is completely in harmony. And that is what we have seen with the China-Africa cooperation. Now, of course, I mean, as was also mentioned by your own colleague, this, the 10 uh, partnership, you know, um, aspects are very holistic, very well-rounded. They encompass uh, all the aspects in which Africa wants to move forward. China's example, development uh, example, is something that Africans across the board, all African countries with diplomatic ties have valued and learned from. So strategic means, you know, uh, the strategic aspect to elevate the relationship to that point is strengthening that mutual goal, those mutual values of respect, and also of moving forward without, without making an adversary of others in a positive sense. And we've seen an exponential improvement, deepening of the relations uh, in the last decades. 
Yes, and and also Zun, just now, uh, as uh, Dr. He mentioned, uh, President Xi said that the Western approach to modernization has inflicted immense sufferings on developing countries. So, yeah. in your opinion, how does China's approach to modernization differ from that of Western countries, and what unique opportunities does it present for Africa? You know, when as actually as Professor He was highlighting that, I was thinking about my own uh, classes. My being from the third world, so to speak, a developing country, we were taught of development in a very different way. As if we are in the waiting room of history, we have to mimic a Western model. Whereas the irony was that our countries, our、uh, you know, our development trajectory was tarnished because of centuries of being、uh, you know mistreated, of our resources being usurped. China and Africa's development, obviously now China's own development model, and this is something that、uh, not only developing countries but even、uh, honest scholarship from developed countries will acknowledge that China's development model is more about value creation, more about mutual growth, more about seeking opportunities that make partners better off as well. And this is a trajectory which is also about recognizing that our solutions. Uh, will depend on you know critical thinking, studying our own unique realities, and understanding how our own people, our own histories, our own experiences can be the biggest asset to moving the, on the way forward. So of course you know first of all, China's development in especially the last forty plus years since the reform and opening up economic development has been based on. Respect has been based on,、uh, you know, ideas that resonate with developing countries as an example for developing countries because it assumed also a unique as well as a respectful approach. And at the same time, when African countries now work with China, they see that even today, Western at times Western partners will come with political uh, stakes, uh, you know, political conditions attached. They will tell what. Precisely, should African countries be doing not based on Africa's own preferences or preferred path forward, but based on Western,、uh, you know,、uh, Western realities or Western perspective? So, what African people, whether they are sitting in the room, you know, like here in Fokak, and even when they meet Western partners, they say exactly this: We want our values, our own unique development path, our own wisdom. To be relevant in our trajectory, we want the African way, and we are capable of finding that way. What we need is positive partnership, and that's where China is a major partner for Africa. I'll also quickly add, you know, China-Africa cooperation, whether it's FOCAC, whether it's other bilateral、uh, platforms, is also an example for other developing countries and regions. Because if people will look at this document that has been released, the Forum on China-Africa Cooperation Beijing Action Plan from 2025 to 2027, it goes into immense depth. That means even for other developing regions, it's important that, like Africans, you sh- they should recognize that they have agency, they should have priorities, and those priorities will match what China can do to create、uh, more possibilities and more success. Yeah, and Dr. He, President Xi mentioned the importance of joint modernization efforts being just and equitable.、Uh, in your view, how will China and Africa ensure that these principles are up- upheld, particularly in areas where there might be differing national interests or power imbalances?、Uh, of course, you know、uh, this summit, China African summit, has been taking place exactly in one of the background. That is this year, 2024,、uh, is the 70th year anniversary of the, the peaceful coexistence、uh, principles、uh, being put forward、uh, by China, India, those、uh, developing countries. You see, uh, those uh, five uh, peaceful coexistence principle、uh, refers to like、uh, equality,、uh, you know, mutual respect. Not interference others、uh, domestic issue other countries. So all those principles,、uh, you know, has been also taken into the UN Charter. So that served as the,、uh, you know, the back,、uh, the very strong,、uh, this stone uh, for uh, all the countries in the world、uh, to have a very harmonious relationship. I think now we are building China Africa relationship in the new era、uh, for this、uh, shared. Uh, this uh, uh, future community, of course,、uh, that will be the principle. Actually,、uh, we just talk about this、uh, China-Africa relation now has been upgraded into strategic level. Yeah, you know, even all the African countries 
Yeah, those countries has diplomatic ties with China. You see, all, all together, uh, will be uh, that that are 50, 53 now have diplomatic ties uh, with China, all the African countries. Or oh, where some countries are very poor, very tiny. So also strategic level. So this is a vivid proof uh, that China treated all the countries, no matter you are small, big, you are strong or weak, uh, you all play this strategic role. Uh, you, you, you are being regarded as equal, as those bigger, strong, uh, those powerful countries. I think this is, uh, again, a uh, show us, uh, you know, show the world uh, that uh, five principles of peaceful coexistence uh, that is very fundamental uh, importance and also has been practiced uh, by China uh, from beginning 70 years ago until now. Yeah, and Dr. He, President Xi, announced this 10 partnership actions plans to be implemented in the next three years, and they cover various areas like trade, health, green development, etc. What is your biggest takeaway from these plans? Oh, yes, those are 10 partnership actions, uh, I think is quite impressive. I think the most one, most uh, uh, impressive one, that uh, that should be the number one. Uh, the number one talking about uh, cultural and also, uh, you know, uh, especially the governance idea, uh, mutually share uh, between China and Africa. We are set up uh, this uh, communication about, uh, uh, you know, the governance issue. Uh, this is a... Uh, before, normally this uh, governance issue, wow, well, seems this is a Western countries, wow, well, they are uh, dormant. Uh, this uh, like uh, election, multi-party uh, democracy, uh, like election and the uh, freedom of speech, uh, all, of, all of this. Seems that this is the way they all keep talking about uh, uh, those uh, uh, capacity building governance in Africa from all the time before. Uh, I joined many, many of these activities uh, before in Africa or in U.S. or in Europe. Uh, seems China has no uh, capacity to talk about those uh, soft infrastructure uh, before. Seems we only can talk about anti-poverty, uh, like build infrastructure, uh, stadium, or railway, whatever. Uh, those things seems uh, things you can touch, things you can feel. Uh, if in uh, terms of uh, governance, well, it seems that's China's uh, weak point. But now seems another di uh, different way. And now this is even very top one, uh, this uh, action plan that we focus on, share uh, those uh, governance idea. Now we have a very uh, a strong this self-confidence. Uh, also, African countries also have a great enthusiasm uh, to uh, want to learn, uh, want to know more about the China's way of this governance. Uh, because if we start good governance, how come uh, China, the country, can be developed that successfully from a poor country before, also very weak, very poor, but now becoming the second biggest economy. Actually, in all the process, uh, even hasn't seen any conflict, uh, like some country, they gone through conflict, mass demonstration on the street, uh, so, so on and so forth. So how China can make it happen? Of course, the governance matters very much. Uh, actually, China also building our own Chinese style democracy. Uh, it's not saying uh, democracy, this was, uh, is that the words only can be talked uh, by uh, liberal democracy people. Uh, actually, democracy is one of the core socialist value among all those 24 words. Uh, the second word is democracy. The first word is uh, prosperity, uh, this value, core socialist value. So the second one, you see, democracy. So now we talk loudly about how to build uh, this Chinese democracy, how to improve uh, this governance, uh, especially in a scientific way, uh, in a modern way. Uh, you cannot, if people are moving forward, their awareness moving forward. And then the leaders governing idea was wow, still lag behind. So how come, how come uh, you can govern the country forward? How come uh, you can feed with people's demands? So that is why uh, those uh, shared experience of governance, I think now matters very much. So that is also not a uh, surprise to know this becoming the very first uh, action plan. 
Okay, so uh, Zun, just now uh, Dr. He said that um, China's idea of democracy is very different from um, the Western-style democracies. But if we mm. look at this governance experience sharing between China and Africa, how do you think it is different from the Western approach, which often seeks to promote uh, the Western ideology? So is, is it Western model versus Chinese model here? I think absolutely, you know, one model is more ideology oriented or thinking that if certain mechanisms, certain systems are in place, then automatically that country is more democratic. And at some point, perhaps that, uh, you know, stamp or that uh, status as a democratic, uh, according to the Western definition, country will achieve progress. But we have seen that every country in the last uh, post-World War II, really, that has achieved real progress has been through good governance. And China is a remarkable example for all African countries. You know, uh, if whether we talk about the sophistication of the governance uh, systems, the priorities, the fact that it is not ideology based as much as really it is about progress and results and about constant receptivity to what are the growing needs of society and how can the governance model be better suited to meet those requirements? What are the tangible results that these government bodies have attained? This is the way to uh, attain and to aspire for good governance. So really, you know, whether even in the last few years in particular, uh, my own experience has been the way African representatives, African delegates have represented in uh, the Democracy Forum or the Human Rights Forum, they talk about the fact that we have needed this kind of interest by partner countries, especially when we say partner countries, we mean countries that can facilitate the process of development. They have needed the interest to actually uh, understand what are the priorities for African nations. And really, in the end, the priorities are we need fewer people to be sleeping on a hungry stomach, you know, in, on an empty belly. We need more people to have jobs. We need more people to have better education. We need to strengthen our economies. We need to address tangible issues. So what kind of governance models, what kind of mechanisms, what kind of priorities in place can help us address the real tangible challenges that we face? This is where really the China-Africa cooperation is also significant because over these years we have seen that multiple African countries see inspiration in how China's development model is really, as Professor He also mentioned, a consequence of a governance model, a system which is result oriented. And this is what developing uh, countries across the world need. They don't need someone telling them, you know, uh, this is the kind of freedom of speech or political culture you need to import, you know, or to mimic. But they they rather need actual solutions to problems that are either worsening or that are being addressed. And now is the time when we look at the SDG action plan, when we look at global consensuses across the board. It's really about addressing tangible issues that are people centric. That's where China has been a remarkable success and example. Yes, and, and Professor He, uh, green development was also highlighted as a key aspect of modernization. So given the diverse environmental challenges across the African continent, how can China-Africa partnership effectively balance industrial growth with sustainable environmental practices? Oh, yes, uh, green development now uh, is uh, not only guiding China, uh, future development forward also we are guiding like Belt and Road and also China African Cooperation uh, because uh, this is the uh, you know the the uh, only way forward now uh, given this climate change uh, now is the biggest challenge now for the global village so actually uh, we have developed a lot of those uh, uh, new technical know-how uh, like uh, now China's uh, top three products uh, now for export, uh, you know, one is uh, the EV, uh, electronic cars, uh, vehicle, and also like uh, lease, uh, lease it, uh, battery and also solar pan, uh, pan, pan, panel. So all those things are already uh, proved to the world that China has been developed very good 
uh, in this uh, green development. So now we also offer uh, this help, high uh, technical know-how and the green development um, uh, methodology and all those uh, uh, new energy, uh, those things uh, with African countries. Actually, African presidents uh, this time around when they came to Beijing uh, to join the summit, even before uh, this uh, summit day, they already travel like to Shenzhen, uh, travel to those uh, uh, you know, our new frontier cities uh, to talk with Huawei company, to visit the BYD com company, yes. BYD. Uh, so all those things have been done already. Yeah. Thank you, Dr. He and Zun Ahmed Khan. You're listening to World Today. We'll be back. You're listening to World Today. I'm Zhao Ying. A new United Nations report says PM2.5 air pollution declined in Europe and China last year. The World Meteorological Organization published the report ahead of International Day of Clean Air for Blue Skies on Saturday. Scientists of the UN agency tend to believe that the decline in Europe and China is the direct result of lower emissions in these countries over the years, saying they have noticed this trend since 2021. PM2.5 are particles smaller than 2.5 micrometers in diameter. They pose a severe health risk if they are inhaled over a long period, as they are tiny enough to get into the bloodstream. The particles mainly come from human activities like the consumption of fossil fuels, transportation, and industrial production. Joining us now in the studio is my colleague Ding Heng. So thanks for being here. Hey, Zhao Yin. What do you make of this report's finding about air pollution decline in China? And, and apart from China and Europe, how does the situation in other regions look like? Well, I think this finding about China is very much consistent with um, the, the personal perception of people living here in China, as well as China's own figures, especially for those of us who live in Beijing, the Chinese capital, if we are to make a comparison between the air quality 10 years ago and now, I guess no one would deny that a significant improvement has been made here. Uh, scientists with the World Meteorological Organization say they have noticed this trend since 2021. Uh, and, uh, and one thing I would like to add here is that during the COVID-19 period between 2020 and 2022, the improvement of air quality in China was a continuation of something that began much earlier than that. According to China's Ministry of Ecology and Environment, the average annual concentration of PM2.5 in major Chinese cities dropped by some 20% from 2019 to 2022. And... Um, Elsewhere, apart from China and Europe, higher PM2.5 emissions have been found in North America last year compared to the previous 20 years because of the wildfire in that region. And also above average PM2.5 levels were also measured over India last year due to an increase in terms of uh, pollution emissions from human and industrial activities. Yeah, China launched a campaign against pollution in 2013, which focused on controlling PM2.5. And in more than 70 Chinese cities tracked by the government, the average yearly number of heavily polluted days declined by more than 80 percent from 2013 to 2022. What do you think is the secret behind this um, success in the reduction of air pollution in China? Yeah, actually, adding to what you have cited, uh, actually, according to a University of Chicago study published last year, despite significant increases in, in PM2.5 in many regions across the world, global pollution has declined since the year 2013. And that decline since then is, 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 is largely because of China's success in terms of sharply reducing its air pollution. This is not me saying it. I'm just quoting from this University of Chicago study. Um, I think the secret behind this perceived success, or to say the least, behind this efficiency, is really about China's determination, political determination especially. Government leaders have 
displays the strong momentum in policy making, and there is also this ability to transmit pressures down to the lower levels of government agencies in order to get things down. But in the meantime, there is also a degree of Policy autonomy and flexibility, because in a country like China, there is really no such thing as one size fits all across different regions in this country.、Um, that being said, much more actually remains to be done in this country as China enters the next phase of a war against smog or a war against the pollution. It needs to place more emphasis on market-oriented approaches in order to more sustainably reduce air pollution at a lower cost. For example, here we already have a carbon emissions trading system, which represents the world's largest carbon、uh, trading market, and this market is forecasted to grow much further. Under plans to add heavy in industry and manufacturing. Well, it seems the key message sent by this latest report is that climate change and air quality go hand in hand and must be tackled together. So, what do you think can be done to make sure that climate change and air quality are not treated separately? Yeah. So, I think to start with, there are some key issues to focus on for our policymakers, like、um, intense heat and persistent droughts because of climate change. These factors or this kind of natural disasters will fuel the risk regarding wildfire and subsequent air pollutions. Which in return will negatively affect our ecosystem because as air pollutants settle from our atmosphere to the surface of our planet,、um, they will reduce the services provided by、uh, natural ecosystems like、uh, clean water, biodiversity, and carbon storage. So. I think that's basically the logic behind this、um, interconnection or interlinkage between、um, climate change and air quality control. So really, a lot will have to be done. And in terms of academia, there are also out to be more interdisciplinary、um, science and research, which will be key to finding solutions. Yeah, thank you, Ding Heng. You're listening to World Today. Stay with us. This is World Today. I'm Zhao Ying. A recent opinion piece on South China Morning Post suggests that while the U.S. doubles down on its hard power, China is making its mark with soft power. The article, written by Peter Chong, a research associate at the Institute of China Studies at the University of Malaya, argues that while the U.S. appears to be relying more on its military might, China is advancing a different approach, emphasizing economic collaboration and trust between civilizations. The article says China's vision of a community with a shared future for mankind is challenging Western worldviews such as the clash of civilizations and the end of history thesis, and is shaping an emerging alternative world order. To delve deeper into these ideas and explore the implications of China's growing soft power on the global stage, we are joined by Einar Tengen, senior fellow at Taihe Institute. The concept of soft power was first introduced by Joseph Nye as the ability to influence others through attraction rather than coercion. But how important do you think soft power is on today's international stage? It's very important when you when you're a unipolar world,、uh, you know, one sole superpower. I mean, soft power, yeah, it's it's、uh, it's nice,、uh, but it isn't necessary. You control all the cards economically, politically, and militarily. A few people can go against you, and there's this attraction that is, you know, if you see a strong leader, you you don't want to cross them. You certainly want to get along with them. But when you start talking about a multipolar world. Uh, where you know countries are now interested in telling their stories, and learning the stories about other countries, understanding each other, soft power becomes incredibly important. It's the basis by which you can reach consensus. If I don't understand you, you don't understand me. What are the chances we're going to reach、uh, long-lasting agreements? So these are the kinds of、uh, building blocks、uh, that are extremely important. Something that、uh, China recognizes, but. It really isn't、uh, quite there in terms of the U.S. I think Europe is better at looking at soft power, but they have problems.、Uh, you know, their colonial past sometimes gets in the way、um, of you know trying to preach to people about how they should be acting. 
Yeah, so this article contrasts the U.S.'s reliance on military power with China's focus on economic collaboration and trust between its civilizations. What's your thought on the main ideas of this article? Okay, so it, yeah, um, it's the U.S. does not just rely on uh, military power. Uh, a large part, almost ninety billion dollars a year, uh, goes into uh, military intelligence. Uh, also, the um, uh, you know the diplomatic establishment and things like that. But a large part of it goes into disinformation, and this is about spreading distrust. Uh, this is an old uh, playbook where you try to create confusion and then you try to take advantage of it. Uh, this is something that has been used not just today, but uh, consistently uh, through a long period. Remember, uh, if you count um, the uh, Native American Indians and say that they have been in dispute with the U.S. ever since the you know 400 treaties have been broken and nothing has been actually resolved, um, the U.S. has never been at peace. It has always been in conflict. So this is um, a, a empire. It ex solves its problems by expanding by taking things from other people. Civilizations don't do that. So when the article talks about uh, the three principles of security, um, development, and civilization, security, I really believe, is not about building up your own army uh, or the PLA. It is really about this principle that every country is deserving of being secure in its borders. And every country no country has the right to have their security dependent on the insecurity of another country or countries. Uh, in terms of the development, development is a path forward for everybody. Um, and these countries need it, especially developing countries where they've had real deficits in terms of their ability to answer the needs of their people. They need a path towards helping them. And this is key to stability. Then when you talk about civilization, it is not about just showcasing China's civilization. It's civilization in terms of respect. The idea that the sovereign countries all have their own mix of languages, culture, history. And these have to be learned, understood, and respected. There's no one path for anybody. It is simply countries have the right to find their own path uh, to where they want to be. And it should not be dictated in the capitals of other countries. Yeah, and the article suggests that uh, the U.S.'s soft power is increasingly being challenged on the global stage. Is that really the case? And if so, what do you think are the key factors contributing to this decline in the U.S. soft power? Well, in in the article, um, you know, they 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 talk about soft power being challenged. That's not true. Um, it's not America's soft power challenge. It's being undermined by America itself. I mean, the invasion of Iraq on a you know pretext that uh, it seems they knew was false, that there were weapons of mass destruction there. Uh, Afghanistan, uh, leaving it after 20 years, a broken country. Um, and then you start looking at Gaza. Um, you know, it, it seems inconceivable uh, that a country that talks about the rule of you know, international order and the rule of law is just simply turning a completely blind eye uh, to the atrocities, not only turning a blind eye, but supplying the very weapons, bombs and bullets that are being used to kill these people. We're fast arriving at a point where if you start looking at excess deaths in Palestine, one tenth of the population will have been killed. Th this is unbelievable that, you know, uh, the U.S. and other countries that follow it are just saying, well, you know, these things happen and we don't like it and maybe Israel should do something. But they keep supplying the means to cause the deaths. And this makes them in a criminal law. I was an attorney um, in a criminal law. If I supply the bullets and you're firing the gun, I'm equally as guilty of you of the people that are murdered. Well, do you see a shift in global influence from the global north to the global south as outlined in the article? It's not a shift. Uh, this, this, I kind of had a sense that there was a very kind of Western-oriented uh, um, view of things. What is happening is, you know, three quarters of the world showed up in, in uh, Beijing for the 10th anniversary of the Belt and Road Initiative. That, that should give you an idea of, of how people see things. They're looking for their own path in life. 
um, you know, today you have the largest uh, conglomeration of leaders outside the UN visiting China for uh, FOCAC. Um, and, and, and this is, you know, this is what is positive. These countries are finding their own way. They reject this idea that a war, a war, there are almost 56 conflicts going on, but only two or three are even merit uh, the front pages of, of uh, the newspapers, especially the Western dominated. And it's always about Ukraine and it's always about Gaza. Gaza is understandable. It's, it's a wedge point as I was talking about earlier. But in terms of Ukraine, you know, people scratch their heads. The wars that have been foisted on Africa, the conflicts in South America, currently in Southeast Asia, these, these aren't important. There, there's no moral um, obligation to do anything. But because there's a war in Ukraine, all of a sudden, you know, the Europeans are demanding, demanding that everybody take action because it's a, uh, it's a moral issue because it's in their backyard. And these are the types of things which are separating um, people's ideas about that. And this is not good. I'm not, this is not a good thing to have the world separating. There's a trust definitely repaired, but you can't do it. Uh, by following these neo-colonial um, playbooks and, and, you know, with attitudes that somehow we sh should tell you what to do regardless of whether we do it ourselves. Hypocrisy, in the end, is going to ruin a lot of these countries' uh, uh, care, um, reputations. So how effective do you think China's vision of a community with a shared future for mankind has been in challenging the traditional Western-centric worldviews, such as Samuel Huntington's Clash of Civilizations and Francis Fukuyama's End of History thesis. And do you believe China's vision is achievable in the current global political climate? Well, if it isn't achievable and there is nothing else being proposed, um, we're looking at a world that is going to be in serious trouble. You have to remember that Huntington and Fukuyama are, I mean, they... They're American exceptionalists. They really do believe that America has some sort of special place in history, that somehow uh, the expansion of the American empire and influence justifies you know, whatever it is that they think the rest of the world needs. Uh, Francis Fukuyama, the end of history, the idea that every country has to come into line uh, with America's idea of democ liberal democratic capitalism hasn't worked. All right. The clash of the civilizations uh, really is is kind of ironic, given that it's talking. It, it, it is um, an opinion given by somebody who's part of a empire that has, as I said, been in continuous conflict since the day it became independent. So can uh, China do this? It depends on the rest of the world, whether they see the value. But increasingly, when you start looking at the uh, Belt and Road Initiative, at uh, FOCAC, at, at the um, BRICS Plus, um, at RCEP, you start realizing that countries are flocking all right, to economic and political groups that allow them to make their own decisions rather than be dictated to. And that, I believe, is what China is offering. Uh, by saying that they have these initiatives and you know a shared future for mankind, they're acknowledging that there has to be a framework for uh, multilateral um, entities to get together. Because there's there's two choices when it comes you know when you you start to have multilateral. It can be chaos, or it can be, it can be consensus. Uh, China is trying to get, uh, go towards the latter. It's easier to go towards the former. But there's a lot of people who feel that the U.S. Uh, believes that chaos favors its brand of empire building. That's Einar Tengen, Senior Fellow at Taihe Institute. This is World Today. We'll be back. The messaging service company Telegram has apologized to South Korea for its handling of deep fake pornographic material shared via its app amid a digital sex crime epidemic in the country. This comes days after South Korean police announced an investigation into Telegram, accusing it of abetting the distribution of such images. Authorities have found that a large number of Telegram chat rooms, many of them operated by teenagers, were creating sexually explicit deepfakes using doctored photographs of young women. For more, Xiaowen spoke with Lee jung yo a South Korean journalist from the Korean Herald, who has been covering the issue. 
first of all, Changchu, do you know anyone around you who has experienced such incident? And how severe is the issue now in South Korea? Um, I do not know of anyone personally who has experienced such problems, but I did get a chance to talk to this seventeen-year-old girl when I was writing my article about, about the recent issue. Mm-hmm. Um, before uh, the incident happened to her, which was about like a year ago, she was very present on social media. She posted a lot of pictures and like videos of herself and her friends there, and she also described as her past self to me as someone who was very happy and super positive. But ever since the incident, she said she terminated all of her social media accounts and she's been under severe emotional distress. And uh, she was also threatened by the perpetrators who found her deep fake photos and videos on Telegram. And they would say things to her like, if you report me to the police, I'm going to send these to your friends and your family. So like, don't even try it. And so because of that, she hasn't been open about what happened to her until very recently when a number of um crimes related to this came up and so she said that she reported it to the police now but she doesn't know anything about those people who basically tortured her for a year because um she just never really got the chance to like try to figure out who these people are Mm -hmm. um but currently in south korea it's not just people like my interviewee who are terminating their uh social media accounts uh, or deleting their photos off themselves online a lot of uh, others, especially um, underage girls, are also doing so. And because of this, because the situation is so so severe, a lot of people are scared to be more present on social media, and they're more refraining themselves from posting pictures of themselves on public accounts because they're scared they don't know where these photos are going to end up. Um, basically, I got this poll uh, from the Korean National Police Agency. Out of the total number of uh, deep fake pornography victims over 2021 2023, um, 59.8% or 15 of them were underage. So, which is why a lot of um, underage girls are more mm-hmm. concerned about them being involved in this case. Yes, as you mentioned, this is a major concern involved teenagers in these crimes. I mean, they are both um, played as offenders and also victims. I saw another number says that over the past three years, teenagers have been uh, responsible for more than two thirds of these offenses. And many of them are also minors. And it happens at schools, middle schools, high schools, universities across the South Korea. So why do you think teenagers are so heavily involved into this crisis? Why, why would they target their classmates, their teachers, and also other females surrounding them? Honestly, for us, while it was shocking to know that so many minors were involved in these crimes, um, according to the latest expert that spoke to, uh, deep faking their peers is really nothing new among them. Apparently, it was something more like a trend and something that was a part of like their play culture. And they did it saying that they just did it for fun and they didn't really know that this had caused harm or that this was a criminal action. Um, and also, as to why there's such a significant number of perpetrators targeting their peers, this is because a lot of the Telegram chat rooms, uh, they were basically broadly labeled as humiliation rooms or friend of friend rooms for specific schools or regions consisting of members who are also a part of the loop specific schools or region. And so a requirement that they added in first chat rooms was to post photos of each other's peers and then they would switch them up in the deepfake content. And that's how you would start to stay active, which is why they were target their peers around them and i guess for them it was also easier for them to get the photo that they needed to do so well do you think that could be one of the reasons why we have seen a big increase in online deepfake crisis recently because as you mentioned in 2021 there were only about 160 cases reported and last year that number, the reported uh, crisis, went up to 300 cases. So what do you think is contributing to the surge uh, in number of deepfake cases? I think the surge could be because there's just not like enough relevant laws that are in place here. Uh, the South Korean law currently, it punishes those who edit or like synthesize or process these deepfake pornographic videos by up to five years in prison or fine about to 50 million won. But it doesn't punish whoever watches or downloads the deepfake pornography. 
And according to some legal experts, even if you are caught responsible for creating fake content, you have to prove that you did it for the purpose of dissemination. And if this can't be proven, the perpetrators can also find a super easy way out where they're not even held responsible for the cr criminal action that they committed. And this point actually has been very heavily criticized by Korean society and relevant activists. So uh, the Korean government recently proposed to make some of that amendments as fast as possible so this loophole can be addressed as well. Actually, this is not a single case here. In 2019, there was an a uh, ninth room scandal and where men use a telegram chat room like this time to blackmail young women into sexual acts. And also there are ongoing spy camps, spy camera issues as well. So why, why is this so challenging for the country, for South Korea to address these issues that specifically targeting women? To what extent do you think these problems stem from structural discrimination against the women. Despite President of South Korea, Yoon suk yeol has said that uh, such issue does not exist. Um, I This is my personal opinion, but I think the reason why it's so hard to address the issue targeting women is because gender conflict is so prominent in South Korea. And being labeled as a feminist in Korea is really shared by even women as well, because there is this overwhelming perception that Korean feminists are radical and they all they want is to be superior to men. And because of this issue, a lot of politicians are also very wary of touching on the topic regarding gender equality and uh, diversity discourse. And so oftentimes when these issues come up, they tackle the specific problem at hand, but they don't address the fact that it could come from structural discrimination or gender discrimination. And so this is I think the reason why the core problem being uh, structural discrimination against women not being will not be able to be solved, um, and because of this, a lot of gender activists in Korea they urge major politicians to acknowledge this problem is related to gender discrimination. But it's hard because they're wary of losing votes from those who speak against feminism, and a lot of them, especially for this current party, because they're a conservative party, a lot of their votes come from the or, or they think that these both come from these people as well. And so they're a little bit um, scared of touching on that part of, um, of her voter circle. And online, you can also find these men being the drivers behind Sartre and hate speech against women, where they blame women and feminists in itself for being the cause behind a lot of difficult social issues that are being mainly talked about in Korea such as like economic and social difficulties and like being distracted by high youth unemployment, spiking housing prices, growing economic inequality, et cetera. And with these arguments at hand, I think you can say that problems like digital sex crimes do come from structural discrimination against women, especially among those who want to feel sense of security or more powerful compared to their female peers. That is Lee Jung Shu, a South South Korea journalist from the Korea Herald, speaking with my colleague Xia Wen. And that's all the time we have for this edition of World Today. To listen to this episode again or to catch up on previous episodes, you can download our podcast by searching World Today. I'm Zhao Ying. Thank you so much for listening. See you next time.